The following is a conversation with Vitalik Buterin, co-creator of and author of the white paper that launched Ethereum and Ether, which is a cryptocurrency that is currently the second largest digital currency after Bitcoin. Ethereum has a lot of interesting technical ideas that are defining the future of blockchain technology. And Vitalik is one of the most brilliant people innovating in the space today. Unlike Satoshi Nakamoto, the unknown person or group that created Bitcoin, Vitalik is very well known and at a young age is thrust into the limelight as one of the main faces of the technology that may redefine the nature of money and all forms of digital transactions in the 21st century. This is the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. If you enjoy it, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcast, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman, spelled F-R-I-D-M-A-N. As usual, I'll do one or two minutes of ads now and never any ads in the middle that can break the flow of the conversation. I hope that works for you and doesn't hurt the listening experience. Quick summary of the ads. Two sponsors, Masterclass and ExpressVPN. Please consider supporting the podcast by signing up to Masterclass at masterclass.com slash lex and getting ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash lexpod. This show is sponsored by Masterclass. Sign up at masterclass.com slash lex to get a discount and to support this podcast. When I first heard about Masterclass, I honestly thought it was too good to be true. For $180 a year, you get an all access pass to watch courses from experts at the top of their field. To list some of my favorites, Chris Hatfield on space exploration, Neil deGrasse Tyson on scientific thinking and communication, Will Wright, the creator of SimCity and Sims on game design. I love that game. Jane Goodall on conservation, Carlos Santana, one of my favorite guitarists on guitar, Gary Kasparov on chess. Obviously, I'm Russian. I love Gary. (laughs) Daniel Negrano on poker, one of my favorite poker players. Also, Phil Ivey uh, gives a course as well, and many, many more. Chris Hadfield explaining how rockets work and the experience of being launched into space alone is worth the money. By way of advice, for me, the key is not to be overwhelmed by the abundance of choice. Pick three courses you want to complete, watch each all the way through from start to finish. It's not that long, but it's an experience that will stick with you for a long time, I promise. It's easily worth the money. You can watch it on basically any device. Once again, sign up at masterclass.com slash Lex to get a discount and to support this podcast. This show is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Download it at expressvpn.com slash lexpod to get a discount and to support this podcast. I've been using ExpressVPN for many years. I honestly love it. It's easy to use, press the big power on button, and your privacy is protected. And if you like, you can make it look like your location is anywhere else in the world. I might be in Boston now, but I can make it look like I'm in New York, London, Paris, or anywhere else. This has a large number of obvious benefits. For example, certainly it allows you to access international versions of streaming websites like the Japanese version of Netflix or the UK version of Hulu. As you probably know, I was born in the Soviet Union. So sadly, given my roots and appreciation of Russian history and culture, my website and the website for this podcast is blocked in Russia. So this is another example of where you can use ExpressVPN to access sites like the podcast that are not accessible in your country. ExpressVPN works on any device you can imagine. I use it on Linux, shout out to Ubuntu, Windows, Android, but it's available everywhere else too. Once again, download it at expressvpn.com slash lexpod to get a discount and to support this podcast. And now here's my conversation with Vitalik Buterin. So before we talk about the fundamental ideas behind Ethereum and cryptocurrency, perhaps it'd be nice to uh, to talk about the the origin story of Bitcoin mm. and the uh, mystery of Satoshi Nakamoto. Mm. 
you give a talk that started with sort of asking the question, what did uh, Satoshi Nakamoto actually invent? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you could say, who is Satoshi Nakamoto and what did he invent? Sure. So Satoshi Nakamoto is uh, the name uh, by which we know the uh, person who uh, originally came up with Bitcoin. So the reason why I say the name by which we know is that uh, this is a um, anonymous uh, fellow who has uh, shown himself to us only um, over the internet uh, just uh, by yeah, first publishing the white paper uh, for Bitcoin, uh, then uh, releasing the original source code for Bitcoin, and then talking to the very early Bitcoin community on Bitcoin forums and uh, and of interacting with them and helping uh, the project along for a couple of years. Um, and then at some point in uh, late 2010 to early 2011, he disappeared. Uh, so Bitcoin is uh, a fairly unique project in how it has this uh, kind of mythical kind of quasi godlike founder who just kind of popped in did the thing and kind of disappeared and we've somehow just never heard from him again so in, in 2008 was so the white paper was the first do you know yes. if the white paper was the first time the name was actually appears satoshi nakamoto i believe so so how is it possible that the creator of such a impactful project remains anonymous that's a tough question and there's no similarity to it in the history of technology, as far as I'm aware. Yeah. So one possibility is that it's Hal Finney, um, because uh, Hal Finney was uh, kind of also active in the Bitcoin community, and as um, Hal Finney um, in those uh, two beginning years. And uh, Hal, who is was, Hal Finney? Maybe uh, he is uh, one of the people in the end of early cypherpunk community. He was uh, so he's a computer scientist. Just yeah, one computer of the scientists, cryptographers, people interested in uh, like technology, internet freedom, like those kinds of topics. Was it correct that that I read that he seemed to have been involved in either the earliest or the first transaction of Bitcoin. Yes. The first transaction of Bitcoin was between Satoshi and Alfini. Do you think he knew who Satoshi was? If he, if was he wasn't Satoshi, Satoshi, probably no. How is it possible to work so closely with people and nevertheless not know anything about their fundamental identity? Is, is this like a natural sort of characteristic of the internet? Hmm. Like if we were to think about it, because you and I just met now Mm -hmm. There's a there's a depth of knowledge that we, we now have about each other that's like physical. Like that's my true. vision system is able to recognize you. Mm -hmm. I can also verify your identity of uniqueness. Like yeah, this, this, mm -hmm. like it's very hard to fake you being you. Yes. Uh, so the internet, <laughs> the internet has a fundamentally different quality to it, which is just fascinating. Can you, maybe yeah, you no, this is that? definitely interesting. As uh, I definitely just know a lot of people just by their internet handles. Yeah. And like, to me, when I think of them, like I see their internet handles and uh, one of them has a kind of profile picture as this uh, kind of face that's kind of not quite human with a bunch of kind of psychedelic colors in it. And when I visualize him, like I just visualize that. That, <laughs> not an actual face. Yeah. You are the creator of the second well, he's currently the second most popular cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. uh, Ethereum. So on this topic, if we just stick on Satoshi Nakamoto for, for a little bit longer, mm -hmm. you may be the most qualified person to speak to the psychology of this anonymity that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Like your identity is known, like we, yes. I've just verified <laughs> it. But uh, from your perspective, what are the benefits in uh, creating a cryptocurrency and then remaining anonymous? Like if it can psychoanalyze mm -hmm. Satoshi Nakamoto, is there something interesting there? Or is it, it just a peculiar quirk of him? It definitely helps create this uh, kind of image of this uh, kind of neutral thing that doesn't belong to anyone. Um, that you, know, you created a project, okay. And because you're anonymous and because uh, you also have, uh, disappear or as unfortunately happened to Hal Finney, if that is him, he ended up, uh, I think, dying of a uh, Lou Gehrig's disease and he's in a cryogenic freezer now. But like if you pop in and you and uh, you create it and, and you're gone and uh, all that's remaining of uh, 
that whole process is the thing itself, then like no one can go and try to um and if interpret any of your other behavior and try to understand like oh the like this person wrote this thing um in some essay at a, at age 16 where he expressed particular opinions about democracy and so because of that this project is like is a statement that's trying to do this specific thing yeah. like it, instead it creates uh, this uh, environment where the thing is what you make of it and hmm. It doesn't have the yeah right the, the the burden of your other ideas political thought and so on so so now that we're sitting with you do you feel the burden of being kind of the face of Ethereum mm. I mean there's a very large community of developers mm -hmm. but nevertheless yeah is there like a burden associated with that there definitely is this is uh, definitely a big reason why I've uh, been trying to kind of push for the Ethereum ecosystem to become more decentralized in many ways. Just encouraging a lot of kind of core Ethereum work to happen outside of the Ethereum foundation and of expanding the number of people that are making different kinds of decisions, having kind of multiple software implementations instead of one and all of these things. Like there's a lot of things that I've tried to do to and remove myself as a single point of uh, failure because that is something that a lot of people criticize, criticize me for. Um, so if you look at like the most uh, fundamentally successful open source projects, uh -huh. it seems that it's mm. like a sad reality when I think uh -huh. about it, is it seems to be that one person is a crucial contributor often. If you look at Linus from, mm -hmm. from, uh, for, uh, for Linux, for the kernel. Yeah, that is possible. And I'm definitely not planning to disappear. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting uh, tension that mm -hmm. uh, projects like this kind of desire a single entity, and yet they're fundamentally distributed. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if there's something interesting to say about that kind of structure and thinking about the future of cryptocurrency. Does there need to be a leader? There's different kinds of leaders. You know, there's uh, there's dictators who control all the money. There's uh, people who control organizations. There's uh, kind of high priests that just have themselves and their Twitter followers. Uh, what kind of leader are you, would you say? Yeah, in these days, um, <laughs> I actually yeah, a bit more in the, high, in the high priest direction than before. Yeah. Like, I definitely actually don't do all that much of kind of going around and like, ordering Ethereum Foundation people to do things because I think those things are important. I, if, if there's something that I do think is important, I, I do just usually kind of say it publicly or just kind of say it to people. And uh, quite often, projects just kind of start doing it. So let's ask the high philosophical question sure. is about money. Yeah. What at the highest level is money? What is money? It's a kind of game, and it's a game where you know, like, we have points, and like, if you have points, there's this one move where you can reduce your points by a number and increase someone else's points by the same number. And these. So it's a fair game, hopefully. Well, it's one kind of fair game. Like, for example, you, you know, you can have other kinds of fair games. Like, you're going to have a game where if I give someone a point and you give someone a point, then instead of that person getting two points, that person gets four points. And that's also fair. Yeah. Um, but. You no, know, money is um, easy to kind of set up and it serves a lot of useful functions. And so it kind of just survives in, in society as a meme for thousands of years. It's, it's useful for the storage of wealth. Mm -hmm. It's useful for the uh, exchange of value. And it's also useful for denominating future payments, a unit De of account. A unit, a unit of account. So what, if you look at the history of money in human mm -hmm. civilization, what, just uh, if, if you're a student of history, like mm -hmm. how has its role or just the mechanisms of money changed over time in your view? Even if we just look at the 20th century or before and then leading up to cryptocurrency, is that something mm -hmm. you think about? Yeah, and I think like the big thing in the 20th century is kind of, we saw a lot more intermediation, I guess. Like, you know, I mean, the first part is kind of the move from you know, bank, uh, adding more of different kinds of banking. And then uh, you, we uh, saw the move from kind of dollars being backed by gold to dollars 
being backed by gold that's only redeemable by certain people to dollars not being backed by anything um to uh, and if this this uh you know, system where you have a bunch of free floating currencies and then people like um, getting kind of bank accounts and then those things becoming electronic people getting accounts with payment processors that have account um bank accounts uh, so so what what do you make of that that's such a fascinating so philosophical idea that uh, money might not be backed by anything mm -hmm. what is that like <laughs> fascinating to you that money can exist without being backed by something physical it definitely is like it's... what do you make of that <laughs> like how how is that possible is that stable if, if you look at the future of human civilization is it possible to have money at the large scale at such a hugely productive and rich societies mm. be able to operate successfully without money being backed by anything physical. I feel like the interesting thing about the 21st century especially is that a lot of the important valuable things are not backed by anything. <laughs> like if you look at like tech companies, for example, like something like Twitter, yes. right? Like you could theoretically imagine that if all of the employees wanted to, they could kind of come together, they would quit, and you know, start working on Twitter 2.0, and then the yeah, value of um, and just kind of build the exact the the exact same product, or possibly build a better product, and then just uh, kind of continue on from there. And the original um, the original Twitter would kind of just not have people left anymore, right? Like right. the. There is theoretically kind of code and like IP that's owned by the company, but in reality, like good programmers could probably read up, rewrite all that stuff in three months. So, the like the reason why the thing has value is just kind of network effects and coordination problems, right? Like these uh, employees in reality aren't going to switch all at once, and also the users aren't all um, all going to switch um, at once because it's just difficult for them to switch at once. And so, there's these kind of Meta stable and of equilibria in interactions between thousands and millions of people that are just actually quite sticky, even though if you try to kind of assume that everyone's a perfectly rational and kind of perfectly slippery spherical cow, they don't seem to exist at all. This that stickiness, do you have a sense, a grasp of the sort of the fun, fundamental dynamic, like the physics of that stickiness? It seems to work, but mm -hmm. uh, and I think some of the cryptocurrency ideas kind of rely on it working yeah it's uh you know it's the sort of thing that's definitely been uh have economically modeled a lot like one of uh, the kind of analogy of something as similar that uh you often see in textbooks as like what is a yeah, government like if for example like 80 percent of uh, people in a country just like tomorrow suddenly had had the idea that like the laws that are currently the laws in the government that currently is the government are just people and some uh, and some other thing is the government and they just kind of start acting like it then that would kind of become the new reality and then the question is well what happens if and if between zero and 80 people or or, or and 80 percent of people start believing that and like what is uh, the thing you also you see is that if there is one of these kind of switches happening, this kind of revolution. Then, if you're the first person to join, then like you pro probably don't have the incentive to do that. But then, if you're the 55th per uh, percentile person to join, then suddenly it becomes quite safe too. And so, it it's definitely is the sort of thing that you can kind of try to analyze and understand mathematically. But one of the kind of results is that the sort of like when the switch happens definitely can be chaotic sometimes yeah but still like to me the idea that uh the network effects that the fact that human beings at a scale of like millions yeah. billions mm -hmm. can share even the idea of currency mm -hmm. like yep. all agree that's just uh mm -hmm. i know economics can model it i'm a skeptic on economic on uh <laughs> It's like, uh, so my, my favorite sort of field, maybe recreationally psychology is trying to understand yep. human behavior. Mm -hmm. And I, I, th I think sometimes people just kind of pretend that they can have a grasp on human behavior, mm -hmm. even though we it's such a messy space that all the models that psychology or economics, those are different perspectives on human behavior mm -hmm. can have are, are, are difficult. 
it's difficult to know how much that's wishful thinking and how much it is actually getting to the core of uh, understanding human behavior. Mm -hmm. But on that idea, what do you think is the role of money in human motivation? So uh -huh. do, do you think money from an economics perspective, from a psychology perspective is core to like human desires? Money is definitely very far from the only motivator. Um, it is a big motivator, and it's uh, one of the closest things you have to a universal motivator. I think because ultimately, in like almost any person in the world, if you ask them to do something, like they'll be more inclined to do it if you also offer some uh, uh, offer the money, right? And that's uh, like. There's definitely many cases where people will do things other than things that maximize how much money they have, and that happens all the time. But like, though a lot of those other things are kind of but much more specific to and of who that person is and of what their situation is, the relationship between the motive and the action and these other things. What do you think is in the interplay of the other motivator from like Nietzsche mm. perspective is power? Do you think money equals power? Do you think those are conflicting ideas? Do you think, I mean, that's the mm -hmm. one of the ideas that decentralized currency, decentralized applications are looking mm -hmm. at is uh, who holds the power. Yeah, money is definitely a kind of power. And there's definitely people who want money because it gives them power. And then even... If my money doesn't seem to kind of explicitly be about money, a lot of uh, things that people spend money on are ultimately about kind of social status of some kind. Um, so I definitely view those two things as kind of interplaying. And then there's also money as uh, just a way of uh, like measuring how successful you are, like as a scoreboard, right? So this kind of gets back to the game. I mean, uh, like if. Uh, you have four billion dollars, then uh, the main benefit you get from going up, well, one of the big benefits you get from going up to six billion dollars is that now instead of uh, being below the guy who has five, you're above the guy who has five. So, so you think money could be kind of uh, in the game of life, it's also a measure of self worth. It's like how we. It's definitely how, how, uh, how a lot of people perceive it. Define ourselves in yeah. a hierarchy of society. Uh, yeah, and I'm not, yeah, not saying it's kind of a healthy thing that people uh, define their self-worth as money because it's definitely kind of far from a uh, perfect indicator of like, how much you uh, uh, value you provide to society or anything like this. But I, I definitely think that like, as a matter of kind of current practice, a bunch of people do feel that way. So what does utopia from an economic perspective look like to you? Hmm. What does a perfect world look like? I guess like, the economists say uh, utopia would be one where kind of everything is kind of incentive aligned in the, um, in the sense that there aren't kind of conflicts between what satisfies your goals and uh, kind of what is uh, good for kind of everyone in the world um, in the world as a whole. What do you think that would um, look like? Does does that mean there's still poor people and rich people? There's still income inequality? Do you think sort of uh, Marxist ideas are strong? Do you think sort of ideas of uh, objectivism, mm. uh, like where the market rules is strong? Like what is there, is there different economic philosophies that just seem to be reflective of what a utopia would be? So I definitely think that existing economic philosophies do end up kind of systematically kind of deviating from the utopia in a lot of ways. Yeah. Like one of the big things I talk about, for example, is public goods, right? And public goods are especially important on the internet, right? Because uh, like the idea is with kind of money as uh, this game where you know I lose a few coin uh, a few coins and you gain the same number of coins is that this usually happens in a trade where I lose some money you gain some money you um, lose a sandwich and I gain a sandwich <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, this uh, kind of model works really well when the thing that we're using money to incentivize this kind of private goods right things that you provide to one person where the benefit comes to one person but the like 
on the internet especially, but also many, many contexts kind of off the internet, there's actions that kind of individuals or groups can take where instead of the benefit going to one person, the benefit just goes to many people at the same time and you can't control who the benefit goes to, right? So for example, this podcast, you know, we publish it and when it's published, uh, you don't have any fine-grained control over like, oh, these 38,000 people can watch it and then like these other 29,000 people can't. Yeah. It's like once the number goes high enough, then you know people will just like copy it. And then when I write articles on a blog, then you know, they're just like free for everyone and that stuff's even harder to prevent anyone from copying. So and aside from that, things like, you know, scientific research, for example, and even taking more pedestrian examples like climate change mitigation would be a big one. Um, uh, so there's a lot of things in the world where you have these kind of individual actions with have concentrated costs and distributed benefits and money as a point system does not do a good job of um, encouraging these things. And one of the kind of other things even kind of tangentially connected to crypto, but kind of theoretically outside of it that I work on is this sort of mechanism called quadratic funding. Mm -hmm. um, and the way to think about it is kind of imagine a point system where you, if uh, like if one person gives uh, coin uh, um, gives uh, coins to one other person, then it works the same way as money. But if multiple people uh, give coins to one person, and they do so anonymously, so it's uh, kind of not in consideration for a specific service to that person themselves, mm -hmm. uh, then the number of coins received by that person is uh, kind of greater than just the sum of the number of coins that have given by those different people. Um, so the actual formula is you take the square root of the amount that each person gave, then you add all the square roots, and then you kind of square the sum. Square the sum. Yeah, and then you give that. And... The idea here would basically be that if, let's say, for example, you just started going off and kind of planting a lot of trees, and there's a bunch of people that are really happy that you're planting trees, and then, so they go and all kind of throw a coin um, your way, then the like there is like basically the fact that kind of you get more than the sum you get this kind of square of some of these of a uh, of square roots of these tiny amounts is um that this actually kind of compensates for the tragedy of the commons, right? And this, there's even this kind of mathematical proof that it sort of optimally compensates for it. What is the tragedy of the commons? Um, this is just this idea that like, if there is this uh, situation where there's some public good that lots of people benefit from, then no individual person wants to contribute to it because if they contribute, they only get a small part of the benefit from their contribution, but they pay the full cost of their contribution. In which context is this? Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, what, what is the term? Quadratic what? Quadratic funding Qu is quadratic the mechanism. Yeah. Like what's, in which context is this mechanism mm -hmm. useful? So uh, yeah. obviously you said to, to, to mm -hmm. combat the tragedy of the commons, but yeah. In which context do you see it as useful, actually, in, practically speaking? Yeah, theoretically, public goods in general, right? So, like, like services, like what? What are we? What are we talking about? What's a public yeah, good? Yeah. So, are, within the um, Ethereum ecosystem, for example, like we've actually uh, tried using this mechanism. I uh, wrote a couple of articles about uh, this kind of on Vitalik.ca, where I go through some of the most recent rounds, and it's been really interesting. Um, some of the top ones that people supported, there were. Um, Things like kind of just online user interfaces that make it easier for people to interact with Ethereum. Um, there was a uh, no documentation, there were podcasts, um, there were kind of software kind of clients, like kind of implementations of uh, the Ethereum protocol, kind of privacy tools, just like lots of things that are kind of useful to lots of people. When a yeah. lot of people are contributing, fu like funding a particular a particular mm -hmm. entity, yeah, uh, that's really that's really interesting. Is there something special about the quadratic, the 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 summing of the square roots? And yeah. The um, square? So another way to think about it is like imagine if n people each uh, give a dollar, then the person gets n squared, right? right. Um, and 
And so each individual person's uh, contribution gets multiplied by n, right? Because you have n people. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of perfectly compensates for the kind, like kind of n to one uh, tragedy of the commons. I just wonder if the, the squared part is somehow yeah. fundamental. No, it, it is. Um, and I'd uh, recommend you go to, uh, on uh, vitalik.ca, I have this article called uh, Quadratic Payments a Primer. Mm -hmm. I'd highly recommend it. It's kind of at least my attempt so far kind of explaining the intuition behind this. Intuition. Mm -hmm. So if we could, can we go to the, the very basic? Mm -hmm. What is the blockchain? Or perhaps we might even start mm -hmm. at the, uh, the, the Byzantine general's problem and Byzantine fault tolerance in mm -hmm. general, that I, I, uh, Bitcoin was mm -hmm. taking steps to uh, providing a solution for. Mm -hmm. So the Byzantine generals problem, it's this uh, paper that uh, Leslie Lamport uh, published in 1982, where he has this thought experiment where if you have two generals that are kind of camped out on opposite sides of a city um, and they're planning uh, when to attack the city, then uh, the question is, and if how could those generals coordinate with each other? And they could send messen messengers between each other, but those messengers uh, kind of could get sniped by the enemy on the ro road. Uh, some of those messages could end up being traitors and if things could end up happening. And uh, with uh, just uh, two uh, mess uh, generals, it turns out that there's kind of no f solution in a finite number of rounds uh, that guarantees that they will uh, be able to kind of coordinate on the same answer. Um, but then in the case where you have more than two generals, and then Leslie analyzes cases like, um, are the mess messages kind of just oral messages? Um, are the messages kind of signed messages? So I can give you a, me a signed message and then you can pass along that signed message and the third party can still verify that I originally ma uh, made that message. And depending on those different cases, there's kind of different bounds on like, given how many generals and how many traders um, uh, among those generals and if, what, like under what conditions you actually can agree when to launch an attack. Uh, so it's actually a big misconception that the, the Byzantine general's problem was unsolved. So let's let Lamport solved it. The thing that was unsolved, though, is that all of these solutions assume that you've already agreed on kind of a fixed list of who the generals are. And these generals have to be kind of semi-trusted to some extent. They can't just be anonymous people because if they're anonymous, then like the enemy could just be 99% of the generals. Uh, so right, right. The, um, in the 1980s and the 1990s, kind of the general use case for distributed system stuff was more kind of enterprisey stuff where you could uh, kind of assume that... Uh, you know, you know who the nodes are that are running these kind of computer networks. So if you want to have some kind of decentralized computer network that pretends to be a single computer and that you can kind of do a, do kind of operations on, then it's made out of these kind of 15 specific computers and we know kind of who and where they are. And so we have a good reason to believe that say at least 11 of them would be fine. And it, yeah. it could also be within a, a single system, almost exactly. like a, almost a network of devices, sensors, yep. so on, like in air, exactly. airplanes. And yep. I think uh, like flight systems in general still use mm -hmm. these kinds of ideas. Yep, yep. Um, so, so that's the 80s. That's the 80s and 90s. Now, the cypherpunks had a different use case in mind, which uh -huh. is that they wanted to create a uh, fully uh, decentralized uh, global permissionless currency. And the problem here is that they didn't want any authorities and they didn't even want any kind of privileged list of people. Right. And so now the question is, well, how do you use these techniques to create consensus when you have no way of kind of measuring identities, right? You have no way of kind of determining whether or not some 99% of uh, participants aren't actually all the same guy. Right. And so the clever solution that Satoshi had, this is uh, kind of going back to the that presentation I made at DEF CON a few months ago where I said that the thing Satoshi invented was crypto economics, um, is this uh, really neat idea that you can use economic resources to kind of limit how many identities you can get. And the... Uh, if there isn't any existing decentralized digital currency, then the only way to do this is with proof of work, right? So with proof of work, the solution is uh, just uh, 
you uh, publish a solution to a hard uh, mathematical puzzle that takes some uh, kind of clearly calculable amount of computational power to solve, you get an identity. And then you solve uh, five of those puzzles, you get five identities. And then these are the identities that we run the consensus algorithm between. So the proof of work mechanism mm -hmm. you just described is like the fundamental idea proposed in the, mm -hmm. in the white paper that yep. defines mm -hmm. Bitcoin. Uh, what's the idea of consensus that we wish to reach? What, what, yeah. uh, why is consensus important here? What is consensus? So, the goal here in just simple technical terms is to basically kind of wire together a set of a large number of computers in such a way that they yeah, kind of pretend to the outside world to be a single computer where that single computer keeps working even if a large portion of the kind of constituents, the computers that make it up break. Right. And kind of break in arbitrary ways. Like they could shut off, they could uh, try to actively break a system, they could do lots of mean things. So the um, reason why the cypherpunks wanted to do this is because they wanted to run one particular program on this virtual computer. And the one particular program that they wanted to run is just a currency system, right? It's a system that just processes a series of transactions. And for every transaction, it verifies uh, that the sender has enough coins to pay for the transaction. It verifies that the digital signature is correct. And if the checks pass, then it subtracts the coins from one account and adds the coins to the other account, roughly. So first of all, the 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 proof of work idea is kind of, I mean, at least to me, seems pretty fa fascinating. It is. I mean, that's a it's kind of a revolutionary <laughs> idea. I mean, is is it is it obvious to come up with that you can use uh, you can exchange basically computational resources for for identity? Mm -hmm. It's uh, It actually has a pretty long history. It was uh, first proposed in a paper by uh, Cynthia Dwork and Nayor in 1994, I believe. And the original use case was uh, combating email spam. Uh, so the idea is that if you send an email, you have to send it with a proof of work attached. And like this makes it reasonably cheap to send emails to your friends, but it makes it really expensive to send spam to a million people. Yeah, that's... Uh... Simple, brilliant idea. So maybe also taking a step back. So what is the role of blockchain in this? What is the blockchain? Sure. So the blockchain, I mean, my way of thinking about it is that it is this uh, kind of system where you have this kind of one virtual computer created by this, a bunch of these uh, uh, nodes in the network. Um, and the reason why uh, the term blockchain is used is because the data structure that these systems use, at least so far, is one uh, where they um, kind of different nodes in the network periodically publish blocks. And a block is a kind of list of transactions uh, together with a pointer, like a hash of a yeah, pre uh, a previous block that it builds on top of. Mm -hmm. um, and so you have a, a series of blocks that, that uh, nodes in the network create where each block points to the previous block. And so you have this chain of them. Is a fault tolerance mechanism built into the idea of blockchain or is there a lot of possibilities of yeah. different ways to make sure there's no funny stuff going on? There are indeed a lot of possibilities. Um, so in a kind of just simple architecture, as I just described, the way the fault tolerance happens is like this, right? So you have a bunch of nodes and they're just happily kind of occasionally creating blocks, building on top of um, each other's uh, blocks. And let's say you have uh, kind of one block, we'll call it kind of block one. Yeah. Um, and then someone else builds uh, another block, honestly, we'll call it block two. Mm -hmm. Then we have an attacker. And what the attacker tries to do is the attacker tries to revert block two. And the way they revert block two is instead of doing the thing they're supposed to do, which is build a block on top of block two, they're going to build another block on top of block one. Mm -hmm. um, so you have block one, which has two children, block two, and then block two prime. Now, this might sometimes even happen by random chance if you know two nodes in the network just happen to create blocks at the same time and they don't hear uh, about each other's things before they create their own. Mm -hmm. But this also could happen because of an attack. Now, if this happens, you have an attack, then the uh, no in the Bitcoin system, uh, the nodes follow the longest chain. Um, so if um, this um, 
attack had happened uh, and if, when the or, uh, original chain had more than two blocks on it. So if it was trying to kind of revert more than more than two blocks, then everyone would just would just ignore it uh, um, and everyone would just keep following the regular chain. But here, you know, we have block two and we have block two prime. And so the two are kind of even. And then whatever block um, the next block is created on top of, so say block three is now created on top of block two prime, then everyone says, uh, agrees that block three is the new head um, and block two prime is just kind of forgotten. And then everyone just kind of peacefully builds on top of block three and the thing continues. So how difficult is it to mess with the system? I, it's, uh, it's, so how, like, if we look at the general problem, like how many, what fraction of people who participate in the system have to be bad players? Mm. in order to mess with it truly like what's your is there is there a good number there there? is um well depending on kind of what your model of the participants is and like what kind of attack we're talking about it's anywhere between 23.2 and 50 percent of what of all of the computing power in the network Sorry, so 22 and 23 point between 23.2 and 50 percent and 50 percent are can be uh, compromised. So like once your once your per your portion of the total um, computing power in the network goes above the 23.2 level, then there's kind of things that you can mean things that you can potentially do. And as your percentage of the network kind of keeps going up, then the your ability to do mean things kind of goes higher. And then if you have above 50%, then you can just break everything. So how, how hard is it to achieve that level? Like it seems that so far, historically speaking, it's been exceptionally difficult. Uh, so this is a challenging question. Um, so the economic cost of uh, acquiring that level of stuff from scratch is uh, fairly high. I think it's uh, somewhere in the low billions of dollars. And uh, when you say that stuff, you mean computational I resources? Mean, yeah. So specifically, specialized hardware and of ASICs uh, that people use to uh, solve these uh, puzzles uh, to do the mining small, these days. Small, small tangent. Uh, mm -hmm. So obviously, I work a lot in deep learning with GPUs and ASICs for that application, mm -hmm. and uh, I tangentially kind of mm -hmm. hear that so many of these, you know, sometimes NVIDIA uh -huh. GPUs are sold out uh -huh. <laughs> because of yes. this other application. Like what do, uh, if you can comment, uh, I don't know if you're familiar or interested mm -hmm. in this space, what kind of ASICs, what kind of hardware is generally used these days for the, to do the actual computation for the, hmm. the proof of work? Sure, example. so in the case of uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are a bit different. Uh, so in the case of Bitcoin, there is an algorithm called uh, SHA-256, it's just a hash function. And so the puzzle is just coming up with a number where the hash of the number is below some threshold. And so, because the hashes are designed to be random, you just have to keep on trying different numbers until one works. And the ASICs uh, are just like specialized circuits that contain and if circuits for evaluating this hash over and over again. And you have kind of like millions or billions of these hash evaluators and just stacked on top of each other inside of a box. And you just keep on running the box 24 seven. And the ASICs, there's literally specialized hardware designed for this. Yes. Oh, this is, we live in an amazing world. <laughs> uh, another tangent, and I'll, I'll come back to the basics, but uh, does quantum computing throw a wrench into any of this? Very good question. So uh, quantum computers have two main uh, kind of families of algorithms that are relevant to cryptography. One is a Shor's algorithm. Mm -hmm. And Shor's algorithm is uh, one that kind of completely breaks uh, the hardness of uh, some specific kinds of mathematical problems. So the one that you've probably heard of is it makes it very easy to factor numbers. Uh, so like figure out kind of what prime factors are that kind of that you need to multiply together to get some number, even if that number is extremely big. Um, Shor's algorithm can also be used to break elliptic curve cryptography. Um, it can break like any kind of hidden order groups. So it, it, it breaks a lot of kind of cryptographic nice things that we're used to. But the good news is that for every kind of major use of uh, things that Shor's algorithm breaks, we already know of uh, quantum proof alternatives. Right. Now, the, we don't use these quantum proof alternatives yet because in many cases they're five to 10 times less efficient, but and, uh, the 
crypto industry in general kind of knows that this is coming eventually and it's kind of ready to uh, take the hit and switch to that stuff when uh, we when we have to the second algorithm that is relevant to cryptography is grover's algorithm and in <clears throat> grover's algorithm uh, might even be kind of more familiar to ai people that's uh, basically usually described as solving search problems um, but the idea here is that if you have a problem of the form, find a number that satisfies some property, um, then if with a classical computer, you need to try kind of n times before, before you find a number, then uh, with a, a quantum computer, you only need to do square root of n computations. Mm -hmm. And Grover's could potentially be used for mining, but... There's two possibilities here. One is that Grover's could be used for mining, and whoever creates uh, the first working quantum computer that could do Grover's will just mine way faster than everyone else, and we'll see another round of uh, what we saw when ASICs came out, which is that kind of the new hardware just kind of dominated the old stuff, and then eventually it switched to a new equilibrium. But by the way, way faster, not exponentially faster. <laughs> Quadratically right? faster. Quadratically faster, yeah. which is not sort of... Uh, it's not game changing, I would say. It's more yeah. like ASICs, like you said, it would be. Uh... Exactly. Yeah. So it would not necessarily break proof of work as a thing. That's right. Yeah. Now, the other kind of possible world, right, is that quantum computers have a lot of overhead. There's a lot of uh, complexity involved in maintaining quantum states. And there's also, as we've been realizing recently, uh, making quantum computers uh, actually work requires kind of quantum error correction, which requires kind of a thousand yeah. real qubits per logical qubit. And so there's the very real possibility that the overhead of running a quantum computer will be higher than the speed up you get with Grover's, <laughs> which would be kind of sad, but which would also mean that a given proof of work will just keep working fine. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> beautifully put. So, so proof of work, is uh, the core idea of Bitcoin. Is there other core ideas before we kind of mm -hmm. take a step towards the origin story and the ideas of Ethereum? Is there other stuff that uh, were key to the white paper of Bitcoin? There is proof of work and then there's just the cryptography and just kind of public keys and signatures that are used to uh, verify transactions. Those two are the big things. So then what is um, the origin story? Maybe the human side, but also mm -hmm. the technical side of Ethereum. Sure. Uh, so I joined the Bitcoin community in uh, 2011, and I started by just writing. I first wrote for this sort of online thing called Bitcoin Weekly. Then I started writing for uh, Bitcoin Magazine. <clears throat> and uh, Sorry to interrupt. You have this sure. funny kind of uh, story, true or not, is uh, that you were disillusioned by the downsides of centralized control from your experience with WoW, World of Warcraft. <laughs> Is this, is this true or you're just being witty? <laughs> uh, I mean, the event is true. The fact that that's the reason I do decentralization <laughs> is witty. <laughs> Maybe just a small tangent. Do, have you always had a skepticism of centralized control? Is that sort to some of, degree, yeah. Ha, has that feeling evolved over time or has that just always been a core feeling that decentralized control is the future of our human society? I mean, it's definitely been something that felt very attractive to me ever since I could have learned that such a thing is sort of possible. It's possible, even technically. Yeah. So great. So you were, you joined the Bitcoin community in 2011, you said you began writing. Mm -hmm. So what, what's next? Started writing, uh, moved from high school to university, halfway in between that, and spent a year in, in uh, university. Um, then at the end of that year, I uh, dropped out to, to do uh, Bitcoin things uh, full time. And this was a combination of continuing to write Bitcoin magazine, but also increasingly work on software projects. And I uh, traveled around the world for about six months and just going to different Bitcoin communities. Like I went to uh, first in New Hampshire, then Spain, other European places, um, Israel, and then San Francisco. And along the way, I've met a lot of other people that are working on different Bitcoin projects. And when I was in uh, Israel, there were some kind of very smart teams there that were working on ideas that people were starting to kind of call Bitcoin 2.0. So one of these was colored coins, which is basically saying that, hey, let's uh, not just use the blockchain for Bitcoin, but let's also kind of issue other kinds of assets on it. And then there was a protocol called Mastercoin that 
supported issuing assets, but also supported many other things uh, like financial contracts, like domain name registration, and a lot of different things together. And I <clears throat> spent some time working with these teams, and I quickly kind of realized that this Mastercoin protocol could be improved by kind of generalizing it more, right? So the master, the analogy I use is that the Mastercoin protocol was like the Swiss Army knife. You have 25 different transaction types for 25 different applications. But what I realized is that you could replace a, bu a bunch of them with things that are more general purpose. So one of them was that you could replace like three transaction types for three types of financial contracts with a generic transaction type for a financial contract that just lets you specify a mathematical formula for kind of who, how much money each side gets. By the way, it, just a small pause. What's, you say financial contract, just the terminology, what is a contract? Um, What's a financial contract? So the, the, this is just generally an agreement where kind of either one or two parties kind of put collateral kind of in, um, and then they, depending on kind of certain conditions, like this could involve prices of assets, this could involve diff um, the actions of the two parties, uh, it could involve other things. Uh, but they kind of get kind of different amounts of uh, of assets out that just depend on things that happened. So a contract is really a financial contract is the, is at the core. It's mm -hmm. the it's the core interactive element of a financial system. Yeah, there's yeah, there's many different kinds of uh, financial contracts. Like there's things like options where you kind of give someone the right to buy a thing that you have for some specific price for some period of time. There's uh, contracts for difference where you basically are kind of making a bet that says like for every dollar this thing goes up I'll give you seven dollars or for every dollar the thing goes down you give me seven dollars or something like that and but the main idea that these contracts have to be enforced and trusted the um, yes exactly you have to trust that they will work out in a system where nobody can be trusted yes <laughs> mm. this is such a beautiful complicated system okay so uh so you were seeking to kind of generalize this basic uh, framework of contracts. Mm -hmm. uh, so what does that entail? So what are, what technically are the steps to creating Ethereum? Sure. So I guess just to kind of continue a bit with this Mastercoin story. Sure. Um, so started by kind of giving ideas for how to generalize the thing, and eventually. Um, this turned into a much uh, more kind of fully fledged proposal that just says, hey, how about you scrap all your features and instead you just um, put in this programming language. And I gave this idea to them and their response was something like, hey, this is great, but this seems complicated and this seems like something that we're not going to be able to put onto our roadmap for a while. And my response to this was like, wait, do you not realize how revolutionary this is? Well, I'll just go do it myself. <laughs> and then I... What was the name of the programming language? I just called it ultimate scripting. <laughs> Great. Uh, so then I uh, kind of went through a couple more rounds of iteration, and then the idea for Ethereum itself started to form. Um, and the idea here is that you just have a blockchain where the core unit of the thing is what we call contracts. It's these kind of accounts that can hold assets um, and that, that have their own internal memory, but that are controlled by a piece of code. Mm -hmm. And so if I send some ether to a contract, the only thing that can determine where that uh, kind of ether, the, uh, the currency inside Ethereum kind of goes right. after that um, is uh, the code of that contract itself. And so basically you're kind of sending assets to computer programs becomes this kind of paradigm for creating these sort of self-executing agreements. Self-executing, it's so cool that code is sort of part of this contract. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what's meant by smart contracts. Yeah. So how hard was it to build this kind of thing? Harder than expected. Um, and originally I actually thought that this would be a thing that I would kind of casually work on for a couple of months, publish, and then go back to university. Mm -hmm. um, then I released it and a bunch of people, or I released the white paper. The white paper, the idea yeah. is there. Yeah. The idea, the white paper. Um, a whole bunch of people came in offering to help. A huge number of people and have expressed interest. And this was something I was totally not expecting. And 
then I kind of realized that this would be something that's kind of much bigger than I had ever um, thought that it would be. And then we started on this kind of much longer development slog of making something that kind of lives up to this sort of much higher level of expectations. What are the, some of the, is it fundamentally like software engineering challenges? It was. Is there social? Okay, so there's- And social. <laughs> so, so what are the biggest interesting challenges that you've learned about human mm. civilization and in, in software engineering through this process? <sighs> So I guess one of the challenges for me is that like I'm one of the kind of apparently unusual geeks who is kind of never treated with anything but kindness in school. Yes. Um, and so when I yeah, got into crypto, I kind of expected everyone would just kind of be the same kind of altruistic and nice in that same way. Um, but the um, kind of... The algorithm that I used for finding co-founders for this thing was not very good. It was sort of literally what computer scientists call the greedy algorithm. It's sort of the first 15 people who replied back offering to help kind of are the co-founders. Oh, you mean like literally the 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 people that for will form to be the the the, the yeah. founders, co-founders of the community. The algorithm. I like how you call it the algorithm. Yeah. Um and so what happened uh, was that uh these um, <laughs> like especially as the project got really big like there started to be a lot of this kind of infighting and there are a lot of like I wanted the thing to be a non-profit and some of them wanted to be a for-profit um, and then there started to be people who were just kind of totally unable to work with each other there were people that were kind of trying to get an advantage for themselves in a lot of different ways and this uh just about six months later led to this big governance crisis. And then we kind of reshuffled leadership a bit. And then uh, the project kept on going. Then nine months later, there was another governance crisis. And then there was a third governance crisis. And so- Is there a way to, if you're looking at the human side of things, is there a way to optimize this aspect of the cryptocurrency world? It seems that there is- um, mm -hmm. From my perspective, there's a lot of different characters and personalities and egos. Mm -hmm. And like you said, uh, I don't know if, you know, I also like to think that m most of the world, most of the people in the world are well-intentioned, mm -hmm. but the way those intentions are realized may perhaps come off as uh, yeah. as, as negative. Like mm -hmm. what, uh, is, there, is there a hopeful message here about creating mm -hmm. a governance structure for a cryptocurrency that, uh, where everyone gets along? <laughs> And after about four rounds of reshuffling, I think we've actually f come up with something that seems to be pretty stable and happy. Um, I think, uh, <sighs> I mean, I definitely do think that you know, most people are well-intentioned. I just think that like one of the reasons why I like decentralization is just because there's like this thing about power where power attracts people with egos. And so that just allows a very small percentage of people to just ruin so many things. You think <laughs> ego has a, you think ego has a use? Like is ego always bad? It yeah, seems like it some sometimes most... does. But then the Ethereum research team, I feel like we've uh, found also kind of a lot, like a lot of very good people that are just kind of, Primarily, you're just interested in things for the technology, and uh, you know, things uh, seem to just generally be going quite well. Yeah, when you're when the focus and the passion is in the tech. So on the so that's the human side of things, but the mm -hmm. technology side, like what have you learned? What what have been the biggest challenges of bringing Ethereum to life on the technology <clears throat> side? So I think first of all, just uh, you know, there's like the first law of software development, which is that when someone gives you a timetable, I'm going to switch the unit of time to the next largest unit of time and add one. Yes. And like, we basically fell victim to that. Um, and uh, <laughs> in, so it, instead of taking uh, like three months, it ended up taking like 20 months to launch the thing. Um, and that was uh, just, I think, underestimating the sheer technical complexity of the thing. Um, there are research challenges, like, so for example, one of the things that we've been saying from the start that we would do, one is a switch from a proof of work to a proof of stake, um, where proof of stake is this uh, alternative consensus mechanism where instead of uh, 
to having to waste a lot of uh, computing power on solving these mathematical puzzles that don't mean anything. You kind of prove that you have access to coins inside of the system, and this uh, kind of gives you some level of participation in the consensus. Can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? I understand the idea of proof of work. Mm -hmm. um, I know that a lot of people say that the idea of proof of stake is really appealing. Can you maybe linger on it a longer, explain what it is? Sure. Uh, so basically the idea is like, if I kind of lock up a hundred coins, then I turn that into a kind of quote virtual miner and the system itself uh, kind of automatically and kind of randomly assigns uh, that in a virtual miner the right to create blocks at particular intervals. And then if someone else has 200 coins and they unlock and lock those 200 coins, then they get a kind of twice as big virtual miner. They'll be able to create their blocks twice as often. And so it tries to kind of do similar things to proof of work, except instead of the thing kind of um, rate limiting your participation being your ability to crank out uh, solutions to kind of hash challenges, the thing that rate limits your participation is kind of how much coins you're kind of locking into this mechanism. Okay, so interesting. So that that limit of participation doesn't require you to run a lot of compute. Mm -hmm. uh, does that mean that the richer you are, mm -hmm. so rich people um, are more like their identity is more right um, and this stable, yeah, I mean, verifiable or whatever whatever the right terminology is. Right. And this is definitely a common critique. I think my usual answer to this is that like proof of work is even more of that kind of system. Yes, exactly. I, yeah, cause... I, I didn't mean it in that statement as a criticism. I think you're exactly right. That's equivalent. The proof of work is the same kind of thing, but in the proof of work, you have to also use physical resources. <laughs> yes, and uh, burn computers and burn trees and all of that stuff. Is there... Um a way to mess with the system of the proof of uh, proof of stake? There is, but you will once again need to have a, a very large portion of all the coins that are locked in the system to do anything bad. Got it. So, yeah, and just to that, maybe take a small tangent. One of the criticisms of cryptocurrency is the fact uh, that I guess for the proof of work mechanism, mm -hmm. you have to use so much energy in the world. Yes. Is uh, one of the motivations of uh, proof of stake is to move away from this? Definitely. Like, w what's your sense of the? Uh, maybe I'm just underinformed. Mm -hmm. Is there like legitimately environmental impact from this? Yeah. Uh, so the latest thing was that Bitcoin consumed as much energy as the country of Austria or something like that. Yeah. yeah and then Ethereum is like right now maybe only like half an order of magnitude smaller than Bitcoin. I've heard you talk about uh, Ethereum 2.0. So what's the what's the dream of Ethereum 2.0? What's mm -hmm. the the status of proof of stake as a mechanism that mm -hmm. Ethereum moves towards? And also, how do you move to a different mechanism of consensus sure. within, within a cryptocurrency? So Ethereum 2.0 is a collection of uh, major upgrades that we've wanted to do to Ethereum for quite some time. The two big ones, uh, one is uh, proof of stake and the other is uh, what we call sharding. Um, sharding solves uh, another problem with blockchains, which is uh, scalability. And what sharding does is it basically says, instead of every participant in the network having to personally download and verify every transaction, every participant in the network only downloads and verifies a small portion of transactions. Mm. And then you kind of randomly distribute who gets how much work. Um, and because the, of how the distribution is random, it still has the property that you need a large portion of the entire network to corrupt what's uh, going on inside of any shard. But the system is still kind of very redundant and very secure. That's brilliant. How, how hard is that to implement and how hard is uh, proof of stake to implement? Like uh, on the technical level, yeah. software level. Proof of stake and sharding are both challenging. Um, I'd say sharding is a bit more challenging. The reason is that proof of stake is kind of just a change to the, how the consensus layer works. Sharding does both that, but it's also a change to the networking layer. Um, the reason is that sharding is kind of pointless if at the networking layer you still do what you do today, which is you kind of gossip everything, which means that if someone publishes something, every other node in the client hears it like, from uh, on the networking layer. And so instead, we have to have kind of subnetworks and the ability to quickly switch between subnetworks and have the subnetworks talk to each other. 
And this is all doable, but it's a uh, more complex architecture, and it's definitely the sort of thing that has not yet been done in cryptocurrency. So most most of the networking layer in uh, cryptocurrency is you're shouting, you're, you're like broadcasting yes. messages, and this is more like ad hoc <clears throat> networks. Like yeah, you're, you're, you're shouting within smaller groups, smaller group, but you have like a bunch of sub net, like exactly, you have, and you have to switch between. Oh man, I'd love to see the. Uh, it's just, so it's a beautiful idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so from a graph theoretic perspective, but just the software that, like <laughs> yeah. who's responsible? Is the Ethereum project, like the people involved, would they be implementing? Like what's the actual, you know, this is like legit software engineering. Uh, who, like, how does that work? How do people collaborate, build that kind of project? Is, is this like almost, um, like, is there a, a, a software engineering lead? Is there, mm -hmm. is, like, is it a legit, almost like large scale open source project? There is, yeah. So um, we have uh, someone named uh, Danny Ryan on our team who's just been brilliant and great all around. And, and he is a kind of de facto kind of development coordinator, I guess. It's like, you have to invent job titles for this stuff. Right? Yes. The reason <laughs> is that um, like we also have this unique kind of organizational structure where the Ethereum Foundation itself kind of does research in-house, but then the actual implementation is done by independent teams that are separate companies and they're located all around the world and you know, like fun places like Australia. Um, and so uh, you, know, you kind of just need a bunch of, kind of almost nonstop cat herding to just keep getting these people to kind of talk to each other and uh, kind of implement the spec, make sure that everyone agrees on uh, kind of what, what's going on and kind of how to interpret different things. Mm. So how far into the future are we from these two mechanisms mm. in Ethereum 2.0? Like what's, what's your sense of the timeline keeping in mind the previous comment you made about the sort of uh, general mm. curse of <laughs> software projects? So Ethereum 2.0 is uh, split into three phases. Uh, so phase zero just creates a proof of stake network, and it's actually separate from uh, kind of proof of uh, the proof of work network at the beginning, just to kind of give it time to grow and improve itself. Do people get to choose? Sorry to interrupt. Do people get to choose? I guess which yes, they which get they get to choose to move over if they want to. Then phase one adds sharding, but it only adds sharding of kind of data storage and not sharding of uh, computation. And then after that, there is kind of the merger phase, which is where the yeah, and if the accounts, uh, kind of smart contracts, like all of the kind of activity on uh, the existing ETH1 system just kind of gets cut and pasted into ETH2. And then the proof of work chain gets forgotten. And then and things, all the things that were living there before just kind of continue living inside of the proof of stake system. So for timelines, um, Phase zero has been uh, kind of almost fully implemented, um, and now it's just a matter of uh, a whole bunch of security auditing and testing. Um, my own experience is that right now it feels like we're at about a phase comparable to when we were doing uh, the original Ethereum launch when we were maybe about four months away from launch. So that's just and a hunch. Then that's just a, that's just a hunch. Yeah. So how, you know, it took it took like o over a decade for people to move from Python 2 to Python 3. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see the move from like this phase of zero of for for different consensus mechanism? Do you see there being a a drastic phase shift in people just kind of jumping to this better mechanism? So in phase zero, I don't expect too many people to do much because in phase zero and phase one, the new chain they get deliberately and if doesn't have too much functionality turned on. Right. It's there just like if you want to be a proof of stake validator, you can get things started. If you want to store data for like other blockchain applications, you can get started. But existing applications will largely keep uh, living on ETH1. And then when the merger happens, then the merger is a uh, operation that happens all at once. Hmm. I mean, so that's kind of one of the benefits of a consensus system that like on the one hand you have to coordinate the upgrade but on the other hand the upgrade can be coordinated so what's casper ffg by the way um casper ffg is the consensus algorithm that we are using for uh, the proof of stake is there something interesting uh specific about casper ffg like some beautiful <clears throat> aspect of it that's uh there is uh, so casper ffg 
combines together kind of two different schools of a consensus algorithm design. Uh, so the general two different schools of the of this design are right. One is a uh, fifty percent fault tolerant but dependent on network synchrony. So 50% fault tolerant, but it, it, it can tolerate up to 50% of faults, but not more. But it depends on an assumption that all of the nodes can talk uh, talk to each other within some uh, of a limited period of time. Like if I send a message, you'll receive it within a few seconds. Um, and the second school is 33% fault tolerant, but safe under asynchrony, which means that like if we agree on something, then that thing is finalized. And even if the network goes horribly wonky the second after that thing is finalized, there's no way to revert that thing. Um, and that's fascinating how you would make that happen. It's uh, definitely quite clever. Um, I'd recommend the uh, Casper FFG paper. Um, if you just search like archive as in like ARXIV and Casper FFG, it's that's right an archive. There. The paper's an archive. Yeah, yeah. Who are the authors? Um, myself and uh, Virgil Griffith. That's awesome. I, I, yeah. I take a small tangent. Uh, this idea of just putting out white papers and papers and putting them on archive and just mm -hmm. putting them publicly is that a, is that at the core? Is that a mm -hmm. necessary component of cryptocurrency? Is that the tradition started with uh, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto? Is, I, what, what, do, what do you make of it? Like, what do you make of the future of that kind of sharing of ideas? I guess so. Yeah, and it's definitely. Something that's like kind of mandatory for crypto because like crypto is all about making systems where you know you don't have to trust the operators to trust that the thing works. And so if uh, anything behind how a system works is closed source, then that kind of uh, kills the point. And so there is the kind of a sense in which the fundamental properties of the category of the thing we're trying to build just kind of forces openness. But also openness just has proven to be a really great way to collaborate. And then there's actually been a lot of, kind of innovation and academic collaboration that's just kind of happened ad hoc in the crypto space the last few years. So like, for example, we have this forum called uh, ETH3Search. That's like E-T-H-R-E-S-E-A-R -E -E and then dot C-H. Mm -hmm. um, and there we publish uh, kind of just ideas in a form that's kind of half formal. Like it's halfway in between, like it's it's a kind of a text write up and then you can have math in it, but it's often kind of much shorter than a paper. Mm. And mo like, it turns out that the great majority of new ideas, like they're just kind of fairly small nuggets that you can explain in like five to 10 lines and they don't really- They don't need the whole formality yeah, they, of a paper, Exactly, right? they don't require the kind of like 10 pages of and a filler and so- Introduction and conclusion is not needed. <laughs> Yeah, and so instead you just kind of publish the idea, and then uh, people can go comment on it. And That's brilliant. Yeah, no, this has been uh, so, really great for us. I think I interrupted you. Was there something else on Casper FFG? That's no, so like just Casper FFG is just kind of combines together these two schools, yes. um, and so basically it creates this system where if you have uh, more than fifty percent that are honest, then he, um, and you have a network synchrony, then uh, the thing kind of goes as a chain. But then if network synchrony fails, then kind of the last few blocks in the chain might um, kind of get replaced. But anything that was finalized by this kind of more asynchronous process uh, gets uh, like can't be reverted. And so you essentially get a kind of best of both worlds between those two models. Okay, so I know what I'm doing tonight. I'm going to be reading the Casper FG paper. Uh, Apologize for the romanticized question, but what to you are some or the most beautiful idea in the world of Ethereum? Just something uh, surprising, something beautiful, something powerful. Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that money can just emerge out of a database if enough people believe in it, I think is <laughs> definitely one of those things that's up there. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that I really love about Ethereum is also this concept of composability. So this is the idea that like if I build an application on top of Ethereum, then you can build an application that talks to my application. 
and you don't even need my permission. You don't, you don't even need to talk to me. Right? So one really fun example of this is there was this kind of game on Ethereum uh, called uh, Crypto Kitties that mm -hmm. just involved kind of breeding digital cats. Yes, and someone else created a game called Crypto Dragons, where the way you play Crypto Dragons is you have a dragon and you have to feed it Crypto Kitties, <laughs> um, and they just. Uh, created the whole thing just like as an ethereum contract that you would send these uh, uh these tokens that are defined by this other ethereum contract and for the interoperability to happen like the projects didn't don't really need to like the teams don't really need to talk to each other you just kind of interface with the existing program so it's uh, yes. arbitrarily composable in this kind of way so you have different uh yeah different groups that could be working so you could see it scaling to just Outside of dragons and kitties, it could be you could build like entire ecosystems of software. Yeah, in kind and of way. in the, I mean, especially in uh, the, the decentralized finance uh, space that's been uh, popping up the last two years, there has been a huge amount of, uh, of really interesting things happen as a result of this. Is it a particular kind of like financial applications kind of thing? Yeah, I mean, there's like stable coins, so this is a uh, kind of tokens uh, retain uh, value um, equal to one dollar but they're kind of backed by uh, crypt uh, cryptocurrency um, then there's decentralized exchanges um so when well, as far as the decentralized exchanges goes um, there's this uh, um, really interesting construction that um, has existed for about one one and a half years now called uniswap mm -hmm. uh, so what uniswap is it's a, a smart contract that holds um, balances of uh, two tokens. We'll call them token A and token B. And it maintains an invariant that the balance of token A multiplied by the balance of token B has to equal the same value. Mm -hmm. And so the way that you trade against a thing is basically like you have this kind of curve, you know, like X times Y equals K. And yeah, before you trade, it's at some point on the curve. After you trade, you just like pick some different any any other point on the curve, and then whatever the delta x is, that's the amount of A tokens you provide. Whatever the delta y is, that's the amount of B tokens you get, or vice versa. And that's just and then kind of the slope is, um, at the current uh, point on the curve kind of is the price, um, and so that just is the whole thing, and that just allows you to kind of have this exchange for tokens and even if there's very few participants and the whole thing is just like so simple and it's just very easy to set up very easy to participate in and it just provides so much value to people so and uh the uh the fundamental the the, the distributed application infrastructure allows that somehow yes so this is a smart contract meeting. This is all a computer program that's just running Got on it. Ethereum. Smart contracts too are just fascinating. They are. <laughs> okay. Do you think cryptocurrency may become the main currency in the world one day? So do, where, where do you think we're headed in terms of the role of currency, the structure mm -hmm. type of currency in the world? I definitely expect um, fiat currencies to continue to exist and continue to be strong. And I definitely expect kind of fiat currencies to also digitize in their own way over the next couple of decades. What's fiat yeah. currency, by the way? Just oh, just like things like US dollars and like dollars and euros and yen and these other things. And they're sort of backed by governments. Yes. But I also expect uh, kind of cryptocurrencies to play this kind of important role in just making sure that people always have an alternative if uh, fiat currencies start breaking. So like if or if you're in you know some kind of very high inflation place like Venezuela for example or if uh, your um, like country just kind of gets cut off uh, from like um, cut off from other financial systems because of like something the banks do like if any kind of if there's even like some major trade disruption or or something worse happens then like cryptocurrencies are the sort of thing that just because of their kind of global neutrality, they're just kind of always there and you can keep using them. It's interesting that you're quite humble about the possibilities of the future of cryptocurrency. Mm. You, you don't think there's a possible future where it mm. uh, becomes the main set of currency because it I... feels like fiat, it feels like mm -hmm. the centralized control by governments of currencies limiting somehow. Maybe mm. in my naive utopian yeah. view of the world. 
It's uh, I mean, it's definitely very possible. Uh, I mean, I think like for cryptocurrencies being the main form of, of uh, value to kind uh, of work well, like you do need to have uh, some f uh, much more price stability than they have today. And I mean, there are now stable coins, and there are kind of crypto cryptocurrencies that try to be more stable than existing things like Bitcoin and Ether. But I mean, that just is. I, to me, the kind of the main challenge. Do you think? Oh, that's. Do you think that's a characteristic of just just being the early days? I mean, it's such <clears throat> a young concept. That Ten years is nothing in the history of money. Yeah, and I think it's a combination of two things, right? One is um, it's uh, uh, it's still early days, but the other is a kind of more durable any kind of economic problem, which is that like demand for currency is volatile, right? Because of like recessions, booms, changes to technology, lots of things, and if people's demand for how much currency they want to hold changes. And if you have a currency that has a fixed supply, then the change in demand has to be entirely expressed as a change in value of the currency. Hmm. And so what that means is that kind of the volatility of demand becomes entirely translated into volatility in kind of prices of things denominated in that currency. But if you have a currency where Instead, the supply can change, and so the supply can kind of go up when there's more demand. Then you have the supply kind of absorbing more of that volatility, and so the price of the currency would absorb less of the volatility. On that topic, so Bitcoin does have a limited supply, a specific fixed mm -hmm. supply. Yes. Uh, what's what's the idea? And uh, Ethereum doesn't, but can you clarify? Mm -hmm. Uh, just on the comment you just made, is Ethereum qualify to the kind of currency that you're talking about and being flexible uh, in the supply? I mean, it's a bit more flexible, but kind of the thing that you would really want is something that's kind of specifically flexible in response to how valuable the currency is. And and I'd recommend you know look at stable coins as well. So like things like Dai, for example. It's uh, and like how do you spell that? D A I. And what uh, what's stable coins? Is that a type of cryptocurrency? It is a type of cryptocurrency. It's um a type of cryptocurrency that's issued by a smart contract, one of these Ethereum computer programs that um, where the smart contract holds a bunch of ether and then it is basically like that people deposit and then it issues die and the reason why people deposit is because they want to kind of go high leverage on their ether and so it kind of pairs these two sets of users one that wants stability and one that kind of wants extra risk together with each other and it basically creates some um, or gives one set of participants a guarantee that they'll be pay uh, that they have this asset that can that, that can be later converted back into ether, but and like specifically at kind of the one dollar rate. And it has some kind of uh, stabilizing network effects. When yeah, it has paired. this. Yeah, it, it has many kinds of stabilizing mechanisms in it. That's fascinating. Okay, this this, this world is awesome. Technically, huh. just from a scientific perspective, it's an awesome mm -hmm. world uh, that I, I often don't see from an outsider's perspective. What I often mm -hmm. see is kind of uh, maybe hype and. A little mm -hmm. bit, if I may say so, like charlatanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't often see, at least from my outsider's perspective, the beautiful science of it and the yep. engineering of it. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe is there a comment you can make of who to follow, how to learn about this world without being um, interrupted by the charlatans and the hype people in this space? I think you do need to just know the specific kind of just people to follow. Like there's, you know, there's all the kind of the cryptographers and the researchers, and there's just like even just the Ethereum research crew, like myself, you know, like Dan Crad, Danny, Justin, and of the other people, are, and then and of the academic cryptographers, and I came in, uh, like. Before um, um, this today, I was at Stanford, and uh, Stanford has the Center for Blockchain Research, and of Dan Bonet, that's a really uh, famous and great cryptographer, um, is uh, you know, running it. And there's a lot of other people there, and there's people working on like, zero knowledge proofs, uh, for example. And um, Zuko from uh, Zcash is uh, kind of one other person that I uh, kind of respect. So. 
I think uh, if you follow the technical, just people, crawl along that. Yeah, yeah. You just uh, start with crawl. the Ethereum group, and then look at the academics, De Bonnet, and so on, yeah, sure. and then yeah. just cautiously expand the network of people you follow. Yeah, exactly. And like, if someone seems too too self promotional, then just yeah, like remove them. Is there books that are so? The, there's these white papers, and we just discussed yeah. about. Sh- about ideas being condensed into really small parts. There is is are, there books that are emerging that are kind of good so, uh, introductory material for So crypto? for historical ones, and there's like Nathaniel Popper's Digital Gold, which is just about the history of Bitcoin. There's like one, and then Matthew Lysing announced that there's one about the history of Ethereum. Um, for technical ones, and there's Andreas Sentinopoulos as mastering <laughs> Ethereum. Great. So um, let me ask you sort of... Uh, Sorry to to pull back to the the idea of governments and decentralized currency. Mm. Uh, you know, there, there's a tension between decentralization of currency and the power of nations, mm-hmm. the power of governments. You, um, what's your sense about that tension? Can is there some rule for regulation of currency? You, mm-hmm. yeah, is there like? Is the government the enemy of digital currency, of distributed currency, or can they be like cautious friends? I mean, I think like the one thing that people forget is that it's clearly not entirely an enemy because I think uh, if uh, there hadn't been so much government regulation on uh, and if centralized uh, digital. Uh, issuing centralized digital currencies, then I, like you know, we'd be seeing things people like Google and Facebook and Twitter just kind of issuing them left and right. And then like if that was the case, then decentralized currencies would still appeal to some people, but they definitely would appeal to less people than today. So even in that sense, I think it's uh, clearly been kind of more of a help, uh, just and have set the stage for the kind of the existence as a, um, of, of the sector in some ways. Um, but also, and I think some of both, you know, like there's definitely things that governments uh, kind of can do in some cases have done to uh, have hurt the spread of uh, and, and of growth of uh, of blockchains. There's uh, things that they've done to help and they've uh, in some cases definitely done a good job of kind of going after fraudulent projects uh, and of going after some of the projects that have some of the kind of craziest and most misleading marketing. Um, there's uh, also the possibility that governments will end up using blockchains uh, for a lot of different things. Like, you know, governments, yeah, I mean, they do a lot more than just regulating, right? Like there's yes. also, like, they have the kind of identity records uh, and they have kind of like property registries, uh, even just their own currency is like secure, like lots of different uh, kind of things that they're operating. And then there's even blockchain applications in a lot of those. Yeah, and they can, you know, they can leverage technology to do a lot of good for our societies. Mm-hmm. It, it, it is a little unfortunate that uh, governments often lag behind mm-hmm. in terms of their uh, acceptance and leverage of technology. If you look at the autonomous vehicle space, AI in general, uh, they're, uh, they're a few years behind. Mm-hmm. And it's, it'd be nice uh, to help them catch up. That's a, that's that's a always ongoing problem. You uh, met Vladimir Putin mm-hmm. to discuss the centralized currency. You're, you're born in the, where were you born? Kolomna. It's a city about 115 kilometers south of Moscow. In Russia. Yes. Yeah, I, I grew up in Moscow. I mean, that's Vladimir Putin is a mm. is a central figure in this part of the world. So, what was that like <laughs> meeting well, m- meeting him? Uh, what was that experience like? He's taller in photos than in person. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, he's. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, that's right. He's five seven, I think mm-hmm. five eight, maybe. Yeah, and that's uh, unfortunately we didn't actually kind of have too much of a chance to talk to him. Like I managed to see him for about one minute at the end of this uh, meeting. And I did get a chance to see a lot, of, like some of the other kind of government ministers, and like he recommended some, and uh, some of them are, in, are are actually kind of interested in trying to use some um, like blockchains to uh, like for various government use cases, they're gonna kind of limit corruption and other things. And I have like 
it's hard to tell from one conversation kind of what things are genuine and what things are just like, oh, blockchain is cool. Let's do blockchain. Right. Mm -hmm. But, you know, when I, when I listen to like um, Barack Obama talk about <laughs> artificial intelligence, mm. there's certain things I hear where, mm. okay, so he might not be an expert in AI, but he know he like actually studied it carefully enough to think about it. Like, he mm -hmm. internal like uh even if it's just reading a wikipedia page huh. like he really thought about what this technology means did you get a sense that uh putin or some of the ministers like thought about blockchain like thought about the fundamentals of technology or like understand it intuitively <laughs> or are they too old school to try to grasp it some are old school some are more new school it depends it's it's definitely like depends on who you talk to I mean that's an open question for me for, with Putin because Putin mm, has said yeah. uh, I don't know. And as I said, AI. I've only talked to him for about one minute. So, but sometimes you can pick up sort of uh, in, insights. As a quick comment, there, there are about maybe you can correct me on this, but there are about three thousand cryptocurrencies being actively traded. Yes, uh, and Ethereum is one of you know a lot of people believe that Ethereum will be the the main cryptocurrency. I think Bitcoin is currently still the main cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. but. Ethereum very likely might become that the the main one. Um, is this kind of diversity good in the crypto world? Do you see it sticking mm -hmm. around? Should there should there be a winner? Like should there be some consensus globally around uh, Bitcoin or around Ethereum? Like what's your what's your sense? I definitely think the diversity is good, and I definitely I think also that there's probably too many people trying to make separate blockchains uh, kind of right now. Yeah. I mean, the number should definitely be greater than one, and probably greater than two or even five. Um, not three thousand. Not three thousand. Yeah, and also not even like forty high quality platforms that try to do the same thing. Yeah, there's definitely this range from just like one person who just like wrongly thinks that you can create a cryptocurrency in like 12 hours and uh, like doesn't even think about kind of the community aspects of maintaining it going to uh, people actually trying but only creating a really tiny one to like scammers uh, to people like uh, making something that's um, actually successful and uh, then you know, there's a lot of different categories of blockchain and kind of project in terms of what it's trying to do and what applications it's for. Um, and I think the experimentation is definitely healthy. If you, you look at the two worlds, there might be a little bit disjoints, but uh, the distributed applications, cryptocurrency, and then the world of artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. Do you see there's some overlap between these worlds that both worry about centralized control? Is there some mm. overlap that's interesting that you think about? Do you think about AI much? Yeah, and I think uh, definitely kind of thought about things like you know, like the a AI kind of control problems and al alignment problems and all of those things. Do you worry about the existential threat of AI? It's definitely one of the things I worry about. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, block. There's a lot of uh, kind of common challenges because in, in both cases, what you're ultimately trying to do is you're trying to kind of get a simple system to direct a more complex system. Like in the case of uh, these uh, strong AIs, the idea would be that the simple system is people and the complex system is well, whatever um, thing uh, the, pe uh, the people end up kind of unleashing on the universe that'll hopefully be a great thing. Um, and in the case of blockchains uh, and of the complex, well, the simple thing is uh, the algorithm, which is a piece of static and fully open source code. And the more complex thing is just the num all of the different possible kind of human actors and, and of the strategies that they uh, might end up used to participate in the network. Mm. Do you think about your own mortality? Like what you um, hope to accomplish in your life? In the oh, I definitely, I definitely think about ending my own mortality. So that's if I gave you the option to live forever, would you? Depends a lot on what the fine bird is. But <laughs> I mean, you know, if it's one of those things where I'm going to be kind of like floating through empty space for ten to the seventy-five years, then no. If it's uh, um, f forever worth of uh, end of having. You know, a fulfilling life with uh, and if 
meaningful like with with friends to sp uh, to spend the time with with kind of meaningful challenges to exp um, explore and kind of inter interesting things to be working on then i think absolutely <laughs> move that's uh beautifully put live forever but uh you'd have to check the fine print mm. i think there's no better way to end it vitalik thank you so much for talking as so exciting to follow your work from oh, a distance you. and uh thank you for creating a revolutionary idea and sticking with it and building it out and mm -hmm. doing some incredible engineering work and thanks for talking today yeah thank you thanks for listening to this conversation with vitalik buterin and thank you to our sponsors express vpn and masterclass please consider supporting the podcast by signing up to masterclass at masterclass.com lex and getting ExpressVPN at expressvpn.com slash lexpod. If you enjoy this podcast, subscribe on YouTube, review it with five stars on Apple Podcasts, support it on Patreon, or simply connect with me on Twitter at Lex Friedman. And now, let me leave you with some words from Vitalik Buterin. The thing that I often ask startups on top of Ethereum is, can you please tell me why using Ethereum blockchain is better than using Excel? And if they can come up with a good answer, that's when you know you got something really interesting. Thank you for listening and hope to see you next time.